John chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. Amen. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now, the Jews' feast of booze was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here, go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to the feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After this saying, he remained in Galilee. Lord, help us with this text today and help us to focus our attention, at least for this moment, to focus our attention upon Christ. May we learn of him, may we worship him, may we follow him. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, you know chapter 6, I hope by now, or know something about it for sure. We've spent enough time in there. Uh, we could have gone quickly or more quickly, but surely you know something. He's done some miraculous things. Uh, we take some stories for common, I suppose. We've heard them so long. But nonetheless, it is miraculous, is it not? Uh, there's thousands of people that are fed from a few loaves of bread and some fish. It's a pretty miraculous event. Now, I do want you to understand that it did get their attention. They were amazed by it. I mean, enough so that they're willing to track the guy down. They're seeking him. They've never seen anyone that can do something like this. And so, in a sense, the sign of the miracle did grab their attention, but the sign of the miracle did not produce saving faith. But it did grab their attention, and they did follow. John 6, 24 said they sought after him. So it did at least give them that. However, as you well know, in John 6, 66, and some other verses there, ultimately, they turned their back on Jesus and would not walk with him any longer. And now, you know, at least from the preacher's perspective, and from yours as well, if you have any heart for soul winning, it does hurt a bit when you invest in someone, the gospel, and they turn away and will have nothing to do with the gospel. And, you know, it does hurt your heart a bit. And so... Jesus sees this, and he sees, literally at this point, thousands who turned away. And it's almost like, well, I can at least go home. And, you know, at home, at least people will listen to me there. But we come to our text, and we find out that his own family doesn't believe him. So you think about the hurt, you try to reach some random person out in the market. But then you, and I know you in this church, you have brothers, sisters, Grandmothers, grandfathers, daughters, and sons, and grandchildren, and, and you, you want them to believe the gospel. You're like, they're 12, they're 15, they're 20, they're 32, oh, they're 81, and you're like, you want them to believe the gospel. And so if they respond by saying, we don't believe you, it hurts, right? I mean, but you're concerned for their eternal soul, where they're going to spend eternity at. I just want you at least to learn this from Christ. He's been here. The masses have turned, and now in our text, his own flesh and blood brothers that have come after him, they're all younger than him, all of his brothers and his sisters, as the other gospel will tell us, they don't believe him. And so he's met with rejection in both sides of the issue. And I would say to you that spiritual blindness in humanity is a very real issue. Yeah. It takes a lot to open somebody's eyes. It takes a lot to unstop somebody's ears. It takes a miracle That's right. to make a hard heart soft. Amen. Yeah. In light of that, then 
It makes sense why Jesus said something like this. The Father must give. The Father must draw. The Father must grant. Why did Jesus say something like that? Because the masses turned their back and my own brothers won't believe me. Yeah. It's like, could anybody teach better than Jesus? Can anybody preach better than Jesus? And then you hear this phraseology in, in evangelism today. I just need to live my life before them. Can you live a more godly life than Christ? But yet in his godliness, his own family won't believe him. Can you imagine growing up as Jesus' brother? He never sinned. I mean, it's got to have an effect upon you, does it not? But it didn't produce, at least at this point, it didn't produce saving faith. They didn't believe him. You say, oh, well, now it makes sense why none can come unless he grants, unless he draws. Why does he say that? Because Jesus is telling us salvation is a miracle. Yeah, yeah. It makes dead people live, blind people see, deaf people hear, lame people rejoice and walk for joy. That's what the gospel does. Amen. It's going to take a miracle for your daughter to be saved. That's right. It's going to take a miracle for your grandson to be saved. A miracle for your neighbor to be saved. A miracle for your own spouse to experience conversion. You see, we're in need here. Amen. We need a great God Amen. to do something in the life of someone else that we're concerned with. Jesus, in this passage, is unmoved by worldly wisdom. He's unmoved by worldly wisdom. Go show yourself to the masses. He's unmoved by worldly wisdom. Jesus marches forward in perfect harmony with his Father. Amen. In every time, in every situation, his chief concern is... What is the Father's will? All right, here we go. Four points. You'll have no trouble remembering these points. Write them down if you like. And you know me, I've got to work with the same letter and my brain explodes. <laughs> Number one, directions. Directions. Verses one and two. You see this, uh, directions. After, the Jesus, after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now, the Jews' feast of booze was at hand. The directions here, are you going to go to this feast? Are you going to go here? Are you going to go to Galilee? Are you going to go to Judea? What are the directions that are here? What's going on? What is the problem that is facing Jesus? If you go back to John chapter 5, this problem is already real, and it just keeps intensifying. So, basically, Jesus is doing public ministry with a death threat on his head almost every day. So if you go back to John, chapter 5, verse 18, just to hear it one more time. And back in 5, 18, you have this one verse tucked in here that says this. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, no, he was not. Their view of him, he was. But he even called God his own father, making himself equal with God. This, in their view, was blasphemous, and they are already set on killing him. So, it's like, where am I going to do ministry? Do I go over here? Do I go over here? Well, if I go over here, I'm thinking that they're going to kill me. Now, Jesus is not afraid of dying, but he's not going to die prematurely. And he uses wisdom here. It's not time yet. We say it like this, quote, While Christ avoided dangers, he did not turn aside a hair's breadth from the course of duty. You want me to put it in East Texas phraseology, it's like this. You don't have to be stupid to get killed. Okay? You don't have to be unwise. I mean, they're seeking to kill me. I'm just going to go over just to get killed. You can get killed just by the natural course of life. Use a little bit of wisdom and don't throw yourself in a situation that you don't need to be in. It's not what we do. It's not what Christ did. Now, here he is in Galilee. He ministered here for about a year. Interesting. He's ministering for about a year in a very rural area with a minority of people without much publicity. Jesus does not make a good church growth candidate. He has no church growth book. He has no billboard. He has no advertisement. And it seems like he's content to hang out at wells with women 
of Samaria. Or hang out at the pool of Bethesda with a guy that's been laying around for 38 years. It's like he's not seeking the spotlight, if you will, in this year of ministry. Now, what's going on is the Feast of Booths. Now, this obviously is a, there's three main feasts, and this is associated uh, with the Old Testament of the harvest gathering. Uh, not the grain gathering that was reaped between April and June, but the harvest of grapes and olives. Now, the feast itself ran for about seven days. It's the length of the feast. And, and so, this event here in, in John 7 is about six months after the feeding of the 5,000. If you need a time reference, about six months has, un, un, uh, has turned over here. Now, the three main feasts, unleavened bread, the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Booths. And that's the one that we have before us, the Feast of Booths. And it's interesting because this is the most celebrated one. It follows real hard on the heels of the atonement. It's the idea of being released from Egypt and going on the other side of this other deliverance. There's a lot of joy, a lot of excitement that is a part of this feast. Anybody who is anybody would be at this Feast of Booths. It's a big happening time. It's, I don't know, akin to you know, something downtown where they close off the streets and they put up all the booths and everybody comes and shakes hands and sells their wares and everybody has a good time, if you will. Now, as he is going there and all of this joy, I would say to you, Jesus didn't intentionally go to get himself killed, as I've already said. And I would say to you that in ministry, use prayer, use counsel, use the accountability of a local church to save you from a lot of heartache. I'll just share one story with you about Jonathan. And Jonathan was in uh, trying to reach an unreached people group down in down below San Cristobal there in the jungle. And he went up to a village. Well, he hasn't even preached. Uh, he hasn't said anything. He's just trying to get to the village. And they all came together with some sticks and things like that, yelling and cursing and chasing at him. It's like, what do you do? He ran. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to intentionally get beat over the head. He's like, look, if somebody's going to beat me over the head, I want him to do it because I preach the gospel. He hasn't even preached yet. It's okay to protect yourself and to run out of a situation like that. You see that here with Christ, it's not his time to die. I'm not going to intentionally go die before my time. Now, that's the direction. Now look at the doubts that surface in verses 3 and 4. So his brothers say to him, in this situation, what's going on here? Here's what you ought to do. So here's their counsel. Leave here and go to Judea. What are we saying? Go to the masses. Go to the crowd. Go to the hubbub, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. Translation, put on a show. Make yourself known. Do something big in the midst of a big crowd. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. And you, you keep seeing this if word, if you do these things. Kind of odd, isn't it? They know he fed the 5,000. Yeah. But if you do... No, it should have said, since you do these things, but if, they're doubting, they're questioning, show yourself to the world, they're expressing, the next verse makes it very clear, they didn't believe him. This disbelief, these doubts that they have here. Now, this is, a, it may not be interesting to you, but the Catholic Church does not believe Mary had any other children. And they have a whole doctrine to defend their position that Mary never had any children. They, because of the Immaculate Conception, she's without sin, and so she produces Jesus without sin. So in their theory, she can't have any other kids because then they would be sinless too. All right, you follow me? That's their position. But it's like the Bible really messes up your position because here it's talking about Jesus' brothers. And I'm pretty stinking sure that James is also Jesus' brother who wrote the book of James. But then if you turn in your Bibles to Matthew 13, in verse 55, not only does he have brothers, they actually have names. And he actually has sisters. In Matthew 13, 55, he says, Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Well, are and are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Or Judas could be Jude. And are not all his sisters with us? Mary had other children. 
The, the only reason that Christ was born without sin, there's no, uh, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So he's separate and different, but they married, Joseph and Mary married. They had normal marital relationship. They had offspring. And so you can say they're all half-brothers of Jesus, but they are his brothers and his sisters. They had a normal functioning family, at least in the sense of offspring. They're all younger, so Jesus is the oldest of the family in that regard. Now, but after, you know, here we have them here doubting and saying if and all of these things. But let me give you a glimmer of hope for your own situation. Just because your family doesn't believe today doesn't mean that they will ever believe. Right. Some hope there, right? You say, you've got a little kid, they get to be 12, 14, they still don't believe, they still haven't been baptized. I don't know if they're ever going to believe. Don't give up. Yeah. It may happen. And for Jesus' brothers, I mean, certainly we should know, James wrote the book of James. He must have been converted at some point, right? Yeah. And then we can read some other texts in regards to that and find out uh, that they came to be believers later. You know, his family had a very bad position early on. Just think about Mark 3.21, after Jesus healed the man with a withered hand, and those with diseases and demonstrated power over demons, the news traveled to his family. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he's out of his mind. His own family thought he had lost his mind. And then you remember in Mark 3, 31 through 35, he said, your mother and your brothers, your sisters, they're out here, they're waiting on you. And you remember what Jesus says to them, who are my mother and my brothers. And looking about those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he's my brother, yeah. sister, and mother. Yeah. The, my true family is made up of believers. So at that point, there's still this disconnect and his family is not a part of his family. Right. We'll find that later, there is a change in many of them. Notice what they say. Let me bring it out again. If you are, then do. If you are, then do. The whole statement means we're not convinced. We doubt what your claim is. His brother's desire is what? It's not uncommon for even us today in different ministries that we do, but his brother's desires are what? Satisfy the crowd. Satisfy the crowd. Before you lose them all. We've got to reach the masses. So you need to satisfy them in some way. Put on a show at the Feast of Booze. And this would be like posting it on Facebook and it going viral. Just put this up in the biggest publicity spotlight. And then everybody will know. Get a big venue. Get lots of people. Leaders. Affect the leaders. What we got to do is we got to reach all the leaders over the religion. And if we can reach them, then it will change the world. So it's a top-down mentality. Get as big as you can. Maybe like the pro-life movement. Let's get as big as we can, and then somebody will listen to us. Get enough power if we get some politicians. And then if we could get a couple of sports figures to speak with you, then the crowds would be even bigger. I, if you want to go Baptist, let's get Billy Graham and the Gaithers in the building. Right? That will generate a crowd. And if we do that and we get the testimony of two NFL players, then we can reach the world. And there's Jesus over there by the well with one woman expounding the gospel. Amen. Oh, well, that'll never work. You can't reach the world like that dealing with one individual, especially a Samaritan woman. That's not the way you reach the world. Is the gospel powerful enough to work that way? That we don't have to have the masses? That we don't have to have the governmental money? Amen. I mean, it's really what they're saying. Go reach the masses and all the leadership, and then you can have the support of all the Jews, and then they can fund your operation. That's what they're saying. Impress the religious elite. I mean, if you only do these things from the small and unpopular place, the people who matter, the people who matter... We'll just think you're simply a rustic, rural preacher. Right? 
That's what I told Jonathan this morning. I said, Jonathan, you're going about it all wrong. You're on the wrong side of the interstate in Port Arthur. If you would move over to Beaumont, where there's a bigger population, you could have a much more successful ministry. That's the way the reasoning goes, even in our religious world. His brother's mistake. What is their mistake? To make a public display at this juncture would eradicate the cross. The cross event wouldn't happen. They want an external show to impress the crowd, but Christ will ultimately give his greatest public display on a cross where he substitutes in the place of sinners. They remain unconvinced of his identity. Which is baffling, is it not? If you believe in the sinlessness of Christ, this is astounding. You're in the same home with Christ for all of these 30 years and he never sins. He never dishonors his parents. He never lies. He never steals. He never breaks the Sabbath. He never murders. He never commits adultery. adultery. He never commits idolatry. He never blasphemes the name of God. And 30 years and you see all of this and you're unclear if he is who he claims to be. Look, I can't even make a day yeah. Yeah. without making some kind of sin. And they viewed him for 30 years not ever sinning. You think, well, surely they believe, but they don't. They're doubting. I'm sowing this this way because I want you to understand it's going to take something extremely powerful right. for someone to be able to see. Amen. It's not oratory ability. It's not whether the preacher's loud or soft, but the spirit of the living God has to make alive. Amen. And if he doesn't, then you're not going to be able to see. I would say religious people in our day, and I could stay on this way too long and I don't want to bore you with it all, but the religious people of our day sound much to me like Jesus' brothers. We must be large to be heard. Is it true? Do you have to be large to be heard? Or could you just be a simple, ordinary, everyday person who loves Christ and tells someone? Yeah. We must use celebrities to reach the masses. They go crazy if you can get a Chicago Bear ex-NFL person to share their testimony at the church. I mean, is that more powerful than some East Texas redneck nobody expounding the gospel from the Bible? I mean, it takes a celebrity to make the gospel more powerful? Is that what we've come to? I and mean, I, mean, I can stand on my head and preach at the same time, somehow the gospel would be more relevant? If I can get some skinny jeans and square glasses and drive a box car, will you listen to me because I'm more powerful? I mean, is that, is that what it is? Or does the gospel stand on its own feet? Yeah. I mean, do we believe this stuff or not? We must perform professionally. Oh, well, nobody's going to come to Briar until you get music done like they do it on the Grammy Awards or something. Wait a minute. What is this? I don't want brothers were, as Piper said, well, the brothers were not professionals. Yeah. We're just simple, ordinary people that's been converted by the grace of God and we're trying to live out Christianity. Amen. Right. In a real world with real people, we have real hurts, real joys. We have all this going on and we just care about people and we hope the gospel would save them. Yeah. We don't have to be professional to make that happen. We don't even have a billboard. Wouldn't that be great? Get a billboard on 7.30 with my picture of Beverly's picture say, Pastors of FBC Briar, then they'll come. Right. My wife told me she'd kill me if we ever did that. <laughs> oh, look, there's a picture of Randall. I want to get saved. Wow. What kind of nonsense is going on? Well, he had a professional website. I'm telling you the masses would come. I always think about this, but this is a side note. You know, I used to race motocross. And the greatest track ever, Mosher Valley. There's no sign. It doesn't exist today. But Mosher Valley, there's no sign. There's no directions. So I raced the Grand Nationals there back in 2002. 10,000 people are there. And the city doesn't even know exists. You say, how do you know that? Because finally, one day the houses moved out there and they found out there was a racetrack there and they hadn't paid taxes in over 30 years and so they closed them down. They didn't even know it was there. But 10,000 people were going there racing every year. So how did they get there? I mean, how, how did that work? They didn't have an advertisement. Right. I'm telling you, people will find a church if they have a love for Christ. Right. There'll be a desire in their heart and somehow they'll just find a place. Right. Even if there's no sun. What do you truly believe? This is a point of 
consideration for yourself. Ask yourself, what do you believe will reach the world? You have to ask that for yourself. It's based on your answer. It'll affect the way in which you live. That what you believe is what you do. Yeah. Do you believe, and I'm just being honest, pastorally speaking, do you believe that one man, one woman in this church, armed with the gospel of God, is enough? Can they reach someone? Can they reach the world? Can they be obedient to Christ? Do they have to be professional? Do they have to go to seminary? Do they have to have a degree? Or could you just be a normal, functioning individual, redneck, hip-hop, whatever generation, I don't even know what letter we're on, and I don't even care. <laughs> could you take the gospel of the substitution of Christ on the cross, the resurrection from the dead, and tell somebody to repent and believe, and it would be powerful enough? I mean, do we believe that? Are we clamoring trying to figure out some event to make it happen? What you believe about the gospel will affect your view of the church and what you do. That's right. If you believe in entertainment, social relationships, and charity, then you'll be all for it. If you believe that nothing matters, that's what you'll do. Nothing. What you believe will affect what you do. Number three, disbelief. It's just one short verse there in your Bible, verse 5. See it there in your text. Not even his brothers believed him. They didn't believe. Now, as I told you earlier, and now I give you some evidence to it, just because there's present disbelief doesn't mean there's always disbelief. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 14, Luke says this. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. There's a group, and they're all praying, together with the women and Mary. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So they didn't believe him here, but in Acts 1.14, they're at a prayer meeting. Mom and brothers are all praying. Something's happened here. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 15.7. You have this, he appeared to this one, he appeared to this one, he appeared to over 500 at one time. Well, he also appeared to one of these, uh, one of these brother, and, his, and this brother was also used to write a New Testament book. He appeared to James, right. then to all the apostles. So he makes an appearance to James himself. So now James is a believer and an author of Scripture. A.W. Pink said this in regards to these things, quote, holy and perfect as Christ was, faultless and flawless as were his character and conduct. Yet, even those who had been brought up with him in the same house believed him not. But his psalm says, I gave you the New Testament, but his psalm says, I have become stranger, a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. This is his position in his public ministry. But in Acts and in Corinthians, we find that they believe. I only offer that to you to say, don't give up hope on your children. Don't give up on your grandchildren. Don't give up on your neighbor, your co-worker. You say, they don't believe. Not today, but they might tomorrow. They might next year. They might 10 years from now. What I'm saying to you is based upon the implications here, don't ever give up on the gospel. At any given moment, the dynamite can explode. At any given moment, there can be an earthquake. At any given moment, a grave can open up and someone can walk out. At any given moment, a blind man might see. At any given moment, a deaf man might hear. At any given moment, somebody might roll up their mat and walk home. At any given moment, somebody who has a stone heart may have a heart of flesh and respond to divine stimuli. Amen. He said, well, how's it? Because at any given point, the gospel could ignite That's right. by simple people like us living our Christianity in the face of reality and sharing and pointing them to Jesus Christ who changed our life. Praying, interceding, and believing. Watching what God can do. And lastly, derision. There's some direction here. Some doubts in my text. 
There's disbelief by his own family. And a worst case scenario, there's derision. And you see that in these last verses, 6 through 9. Jesus said to them, Now, some of these words here are going to be some burning words you might not like or might not agree with, but it is the implication of the text. Jesus is saying this to his own family, to his own relatives. My time is not yet come. I'm working on a divine timetable. I can't go outside of this divine timetable. My will is to do his will. I'm under divine decree. But your time is always here. Translation, you can do whatever you want. Now that has weird implications. Because if you're of the world and you don't believe the gospel, you might as well live however you want because you're going to hell anyway. Right. Right. You can do whatever you want because you're not under divine timetable here. You're out in the world on your own, so you can do whatever you want in that sense. The world cannot hate you. That's not a great statement. Right. It's not great for someone to say, man, everybody in the world loves you. That sounds like a very bad statement. If all the world loves you and thinks you're great, maybe you don't know Christ and you're not living for the gospel. And Jesus says, but it hates me. Why does the world hate Christ? Well, simply because he testifies about it that its works are evil. They went to the abortion clinic yesterday. Why do they hate them? Because they tell them about life. They tell them what's right and wrong. They tell them the gospel. That's why the anger is there. He's a random citizen who tries to drive up on the curb to run somebody over. What do you do with that? They hate you. They hate you standing there. Because the world hates truth. You go up to the feast. You can go, on up, guys, I, I'm not going. I'm not going at this time. He goes, eventually, we'll talk about that later, but I, I'm not going up this, to the feast for my time's not yet fully come. And so he remained there for a little bit of time. Derision. This point in time is not an implication to the cross. It just has to do with time. Timetable of daily living. It's not to be confused with it's not my hour. It's not my time. It's a different word. It's a different implication. So the reference he's making here is not about the cross. It's just about his daily life. His daily living. And by the way, it's not that he will not go because he ends up going. But he will only go when it's time to go. Even if that's five minutes later, I'm just not going when the world tells me to go. I'm going when my Father tells me to go. Amen. It's a burning word here. It seems awful harsh to us. Quote, His brothers may, feel, may, they may freely and without danger appear at all hours before the world. Why? Because the world is friendly and favorable to them. But Jesus is in dread of his person. And justly because the world is his mortal enemy. The world is seeking to murder him. Right. He's the mortal enemy of the world. You understand the implications. Here he is in human flesh. And the world is saying, how can we murder this man? It's almost like an axe with the Apostle Paul. They, they swear an oath and say, we will not eat until we kill him. They had to get a word around and secretly deliver him out of the city with a cohort in order that he didn't get murdered. It's like that for Christ. The world hates him. This is the problem I have with the gospel this day. It's the problem I have with religion today. It's like, oh, it's all good and we all fit in. If you have a true gospel, you can't fit in with the world. You can be nice, you can be humble, you can be loving, you can be patient, and you can be kind. But at the end of the day, you're saying, you're a depraved sinner. Unless you repent and believe, you're going to hell. The world doesn't want to hear that. I, just, I remember Walter Martin, and man, he was so controversial on the radio, he was so controversial on TV, that lady was screaming at him, you're so mean, and your, your voice is so harsh. And so he just smiled, he says, on the outside, you're, you're like a whitewashed tomb, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. <laughs> well, then she was really mad. Because it no matter how you say it, the truth is offensive. And you make him twice the son of hell as you are. That's what Jesus said. Isn't he so loving? That's not my Jesus. Well, I don't know what Jesus you have, but that's what he said in Matthew 23. 
In effect, Jesus is saying to his family, it seems hard to us. You try this at Thanksgiving and you'll understand. You say to your family, without saving faith, you can do whatever you want. Go be an adulterer. Go murder somebody. Go rob a bank. You better do what you're going to do because it won't be long. You'll be in hell. You're just going to do whatever. If you're not going to believe in Christ, your life doesn't even matter. This, in effect, is what he says here. Without saving faith, do whatever you want. Whatever you want, for the end, for in the end, you're going to hell anyways. But see, the believer has submitted himself to Christ. And what you do or do not do is important. For in the end, we're going to glory. Give an account to our Lord to worship Him for all of eternity. Amen. The world is not able to hate His brothers because they are one of them. Yep. Quote, when Christ says that the world hated Him on this account, He means that the gospel cannot be faithfully preached. Listen, the gospel cannot be faithfully preached without summoning the whole world as guilty to the judgment seat of God that flesh and blood must thus be crushed and reduced to nothing according to the saying when the spirit shall come he will reprove the world of sin that's the essence of the gospel. You're summoning the entire world and you're saying you're guilty before God. Yeah. You've heard me say this at least somewhere back in the past, but this is not baffling you. Why does the world love Mother Teresa and hate Christ? Well, she did all these good works. Have you not read about Calcutta? Have you not read her biography? Have you not seen all the things she's done? Yes, I've read it all. Yes, I've read the biography. Yes, I've seen it all. But she, i make this word up, but she never did gooder than Christ. Right? I mean, she didn't, she didn't supersede him in good works. She never did better or gooder than Christ. But yet they hate him and love her. Why? You say, that's been young, poor Cain. What well, is the problem here? Why do they love her? Because she was not testifying that their works were evil and they must repent. That's, right, that's the issue. And that's exactly what Christ does. In holiness, godliness, and purity, he summons the whole world before the tribunal of God and he says, you're guilty. You've lied, you've stolen, you've committed adultery, you've murdered, you've coveted, you're an idolater, you break the Sabbath every week, and you're guilty before God. And unless you repent and believe upon Christ, you're going to be condemned to the eternal hell. And the world says, we don't want this man to rule over us. He says that in the gospel. We do not want this man to rule over us. But yet in that same vein, it is Christ who can atone for their guilt. It is Christ who substitutes in their place right. for everyone who would repent and believe Him and have forgiveness of sins. Psalms 32, blessed is He whose transgressions are forgiven. And against Him there's no sin on His account. Jesus doesn't need directions. He made the road. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus ought not to be doubted by you because everything he said, he accomplished. Jesus should not be disbelieved because if you don't believe him, you will go to hell. That's right. And Jesus must not be derided by you or he will deride you on judgment day. Do you see him hanging there, pleading with the world, come, come to Christ. Come and believe. Don't be unbelieving any longer. Believe upon him, the one who substituted for you and was resurrected from the dead on the third day, who lives forevermore, is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, and one day he is coming to gather his church unto himself. Would you believe him and rejoice in him? Amen. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I don't know anyone like him. I thank you for his patience. I thank you for his truth. I thank you for his obedience. I thank you for his sinlessness. I thank you. 
that he would be willing to save a sinner like me. I thank you for the gospel. I pray for this church that the gospel would never grow calm, would never grow cold, but it would always generate life and joy, pleasure and zeal to the uttermost. That each individual believer would live out their Christianity verbally and by example in order that the world could be confronted with their great need. And Lord, that as we do, we would see sinners come to repentance and faith. So Lord, we commit these things to you. We trust, Holy Spirit, that you would work these into our hearts, that we would be the people you have called us to be. We pray these things by your Spirit, in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, with great pleasure and joy, uh, I want to introduce to you the speaker.